Good morning. It is Good morning. Day to have synchronicity. I am so excited um, to be here in this healing space. We are joined with a fellow clinician, a fellow LCSW. So I'm always happy to speak with individuals in the field. We have Miss Ronette with um, Ivory Park LLC over in Dallas. Good morning, Ronette. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. So really excited to have some conversations. I just want to jump right in and hear all about what is going on in Texas and who are the individuals you are serving. So tell us about Ivory Park LLC. And especially, I love that name. Let me know what it means to you. Oh my gosh. So Ivory Park is a kind of a combination of a couple things. We really liked uh, the strength of the tusk of the ivory of the elephant, really coming back mm -hmm. to our core, um, to the motherland, and really thinking about how that also reflects the need to walk, right? The walk, the journey. So Ivory mm -hmm. Park is truly an understanding of compassion, strength, and then helping people find their purpose along the path. You know, you think about like a park bench. And if you're sitting there, you're really walking through life with people, watching them grow. Um, and I feel like that's what we do as therapists, as clinicians. Oh, I love it. I love it. So you are co-founder. Yes. Ivory. Yes. Tell me about that. Who are you working so, with? Yeah. So my partner and I, uh, Zahara Williams and myself, we um, saw a gap in, in services specifically for clinicians. Uh, we found that we were working with interns and trainees, and there was just a really large learning deficit as it relates to working with um, families, couples, and individuals. Um, and so we really decided to start our agency to focus on that gap, that training gap, right? Really focusing on clinical um diagnosis, understanding of clinical social work um, and practice. We worked with a lot of LMFTs and LPCs to help them get like a more broad sense of how we do clinical work. Um, so that's how we kind of started. And then it just sort of morphed. Um, people started coming to us and saying, we love what you're talking about in this space as trainers, as educators, um, but you guys should pick up patients. Like I have so many patients that need your services, that need your help. Um, and so that's kind of where we pivoted. And so we've been doing kind of a little bit of everything. We do clinical supervision. We do education and training CEUs. And now we also now do uh, clinical therapy. Wow, amazing. That is amazing stuff. And so I know that your home base is in Dallas. Do you serve other clients? Yeah, we do. Uh, we actually are 100% virtual because, you know, in this life, we all have 50,000 things going on, right? And most of us can't really afford to spend an hour in traffic to get to our clinician, right, to go to therapy and sit on a couch in person. Um, so we provide services for, um, for folks, mostly adults, primarily adults, um, who are in um, Texas, Ohio, and in Michigan. Um, so we've yeah. been really fortunate to be able to expand our base and our services. That's amazing. Really good stuff. And so is there a waiting list at this time? Um, it depends who you ask. Um, I would I would say uh, for myself, I'm about four weeks out. I think Sahara is about two weeks out. So it kind of fluctuates. We'll go in and out of having access and space. Uh, but for the most part, we try to keep ourselves available. And if we're not, we try to communicate that very well up front. Um, one of the things I've learned, you know, listening to people when they call me, reach out for therapy, is that some of us are not very good at responding to people. You know, people will call and say, hey, are you available for services? And people just don't respond. Um, I know we're all, you know, taxed to the max with COVID and all the other things that have been happening in our lives. But um, I really think it's important for us to always respond. Um, even mm -hmm. if we don't have the space or capacity and to give them referrals or references. Yeah, really good. Really good. Yeah. Um, and so you were saying that not only do you serve clients, but you also um, serve as an educator for yeah. fellow clinicians. Yeah. Which, which hat or which role um, would you say if you had to choose? Which one do you like the best? <laughs> oh, no. Don't make me choose. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. You know, that's a tough, so tough. Um, 
I love being a clinician. I think that's really my core self. I think as a as a clinician, that truly is who I am. I, I love working with uh, with clients. I I truly enjoy it. I like the training part because I get to help people help clients. So um, so I guess the the answer in short is probably the clinical care is probably my my core self. Yes. Okay. Good. So talk to us about why a clinician. Why would it be important for clinicians to further their training and further their education? So we've already completed that master's program, licensure. We are ready to take the world by storm. Why is it important to keep um, training and keep educating yourself? Oh, my gosh. Well, growth is so important in this field and self-awareness. And over time, we change and grow, too, as people, right, as clinicians. And what we are interested in may change as well. So we really need to continuously be learning new things, especially as the scope of practice changes for us. You know, now there's a lot of people in uh, LCSFU work doing, you know, forensic assessments. There's so many opportunities to grow and, and develop your skill set. Um, and if you're not doing that, then you become stagnant, right? You're repeating things that are maybe outdated. Mm -hmm. Um, that are no longer relevant to our client populations that we serve. And really, it could be a detriment to them. So without Mm -hmm. really continuing education, I I really don't see that you could be a good uh, service person uh, Mm -hmm. in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spot on, spot on with that. So as clinicians, we've kind of pivoted from um, being in the office. And (laughs) now we are, a lot of us, if not the majority of us, are now telecommuting. And yeah. um, hybrid uh, schedules and offering more virtual care. Yeah. As you have trained clinicians, have you had to curtail training to kind of cover some of the ethical decisions or um, just some of the things that now come along with this new world? Because this is really new for a lot of us. Yeah. Funny that you mentioned that right before the pandemic hit, we actually came up with a, a really uh, fantastic training on ethics um, related to um, blurred lines thinking about really moving into this space because we had moved into this space prior to the pandemic doing uh, primarily virtual services. Um, So we actually started building an ethics program specifically around telehealth services uh, back in 2019. Um, So really timely, Um, but definitely has been something that has been a passion of mine in terms of making sure people are respecting um, HIPAA, not just utilizing the easy way out. You know, we don't want to use our iPhones for FaceTime with our clients. Clients. We truly want to protect their privacy and their confidentiality by using HIPAA compliant platforms like the ones we're on right now and um, others that others use as well. So we definitely want to continue to do that and to serve our clients in a way that's uh, really pushing them to be their best self, but also making sure that we are in compliance with our standards for our licensure. Yeah, really good. Really important, right? And now that um, we have moved away from being in the office, um, yeah your thought process kind of moves, moves away from some of those um, um, standards that yeah. you know, are held to. So it's really good to have that refresher and have a point of reference and a place yeah. um, that can kind of put us back um, grounded to what we're supposed to be doing. So this stuff. So some clinicians that I've talked to um, staying on that um, idea of this new virtual environment, they mm-hmm. have said that they felt as though it's not as warm as it used yeah. to be when we were in the office. Could you speak yeah. to that? How do you feel? Have you guys addressed that at all? You know, I've, I've never felt that way. You know, I think you make the session warm. You know, your personality is supposed to create that space. So I think my question for somebody saying that is, what are you doing to create warmth in your sessions? What are you doing to invite the client to be their full selves? Are you asking them to, you know, pull up a chair, get in their comfortable pajamas while they're talking, right? Obviously, you want them to be fully clothed, but... Are you in a space where you can be your full self? You know, if you need to come to session with your hair wrap, come to session with your hair wrap. Like some of the things that I feel like we weren't able to do in a in a clinical setting, we can kind of relax a little bit more um, and create that warmth. You know, I tell people if you have, you know, a she shed or a man cave that we can meet in, let's meet in that space. Walk me through how this space is comfortable for you. Tell me about the the things that you need in this space that help you feel relaxed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and so I know that I 
that that your organization has work um, has a new couples workbook. That yeah. how could you tell us about this? The idea um, that yeah. manifested this new workbook, and um, when should we expect it? And some of the things that we can expect in this book. Absolutely. So um, the workbook was really born from a couple of things. We recognize that a lot of couples, even though they're struggling in their relationships or may just need to talk about kind of foundational things as they're getting started in their relationship, a lot of the important conversations are missed or they're not seeming, they're not deemed important along the way, right? And so then we get into these relationships and we're like, wait, my fundamental beliefs and values are not quite lining up with yours. Um, and so we are really trying to help people break down their communication, their conflict style, um, really trying to help them with parenting, co-parenting positively, right? Not positive parenting per se, but collaborative parenting, whether you're in a blended family, an original family, um, a broken family, because some of us have all of the things, right, um, that we need to have a space and a place and usually sometimes even skills to be able to have conversations. Um, you know, if you're growing up, some of us had wonderful parents who taught us how to express ourselves in a way that was positive and um, can have conflict management skills, and some of us didn't have that. Um, so really, we try to meet everybody where they are on that journey um, and try to get everybody to the same level. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. One of the things that I've heard working with couples is attachment style. Everyone has read the book and they, yes. they come in and they tell me what their attachment style is and their partner is anxious and they're yes. else and shed some light on that. What are your thoughts about this? Oh, goodness. So attachment styles are important, um, but they're not as important in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things as communication, right? Mm -hmm. We can have all kinds of different communication styles. And if we're not able to hear each other and listen, um, truly listen, not listening to respond, but listening to be engaged, to be inquisitive, to learn more about our partner, um, our attachment style really will be somewhat irrelevant um, because we haven't really met them at their heart, right? Met them at their core self. And that's really the most important part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. Another thing that I've seen with couples is that you'll have that one couple when they are, uh, or that one partner, I should say, when they are confronted, they shut down, right? Um, they don't know how to respond. That yep. fear response comes in. Um, yeah. If you would be able to give us a few tips on what to do when that happens, what would you say? What would you even say to the partner who's trying to elicit that communication, but the other partner has completely um, been turned into a deer in the headlights and kind of shut yeah. down? Oh, my goodness. I would say it's probably not the right time to try to pull them out of it. Um, but I would even just maybe start with acknowledging what you're seeing. You know, hey, my love. Um, you know, I noticed that right now you seem a little distant or a little bit, you know, shut down and you're not really ready to talk right now. How about I give you some space, right? Mm -hmm. How about I give you some space and can we try the, this conversation again in an hour, maybe two hours? Mm -hmm. um, because it's an important conversation, but I see right now you're not in the space to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. That good empathy and compassion, right? It's like yeah, meet it. them where they are. <laughs> And then sprinkling that, hey, my love, you know, you kind of yes. soften it a little bit. Yes. So really, really enjoy that. Um, last question on couples. So would you say, is it healthy for couples to argue? Oh, of course. You don't mm -hmm. grow without conflict. Actually, that's one of my favorite chapters in our new workbook. It's all about conflict. Conflict is how we stretch and grow, right? That getting out of our comfort zone, getting out of what we think and being really one tracked and merging our ideas and beliefs with our partner and coming up with new ones is really how the relationship develops and grows. So if we don't have conflict, how are we going to make any progress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. So you are out here pouring yourself into clinicians, couples, and clients. You got the three C's going on. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. <laughs> yes, you are stretching yourself. Tell us some stress reduction techniques that you currently utilize. How is it that 
um, you remain grounded so that you can show up uh, for the three C's? Oh my goodness, that's a great question. Um, one of the first things is I have a monthly massage membership <laughs> that I make sure I utilize faithfully. Um, but on a day to day, I love walking and stretching. Um, I will do like a no screen time um, in between clients or um, in between transitions uh, because it helps me to really kind of reset myself. Um, and, and to be quiet, just learning sometimes just to be quiet and be okay with the quietness in my space um, has been really helpful for me. Yeah, good, good stuff. How can a person find you? So if they're a client or if they're a clinician and they're saying to themselves, she is really blowing up my alley, I need more. How can someone find, get in touch with Ivory Park? Absolutely. So we're on Instagram. We are also on Facebook, but the easiest way would be just to go to our website, www.ireparkplc.com. Good. I will make sure that is pinned under your video. What else? What else would you like to share with us this morning that we didn't have the opportunity to cover? Oh, my gosh. I just so appreciate you and everything that you're doing and the space that you're creating for people. It's just so beautiful. And I'm just so happy to be a part of it, even if it's a tiny morsel of what you're doing. So please keep doing what you're doing. Um, and I appreciate you having me in your space. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Humble, humble, humble. Thank you. Um, so it is always a good day to have synchronicity. We really um, appreciate you joining us on the couch. Until next time, our wish for you, our goal for you is to continue to be brave, be magical, and above all else, be well. Take care.